Welcome to the 2024 Wood Whisperer Shop Tour. So today we're gonna to cover a lot of ground, including the changes that we've made since the last update, my layout and workflow, any new tools that we have in the shop. And of course, we're gonna walk around and look at all the tools that we have here and stick around to the end because we're gonna have sort of a Q and A where you guys ask questions and I'm gonna show you exactly what you're looking for. So let's jump right in with some of the changes that we made since our last update. The last shop update we did was October of 2022 and a lot has changed since then. First off, Jason no longer works for me. The first year was always intended to be a trial since I really needed extra muscle on all the renovations and Jason isn't really a woodworker. After the first year, he felt it was time to get back to his previous line of work, exotic dancing, That's what they want. and we parted ways. But I can't seem to totally get rid of him because I married his sister. Hey, Nicole, would you like to go on a date with me? This is what I looked like back then. So now I'm back working solo and honestly, I love it. There are certainly benefits to having help in the shop, but I'm a natural introvert who's perfectly happy working a 10 hour a day with no interaction with anyone other than Oreo. Boop. And that relationship is working out great. I feed him, I play with him, groom him, and he gives me poison ivy and ticks. So it all works out in the end. For the exterior of the building, we did quite a bit this year, including painting the doors so they look a little less 70s firehouse. We also added a cool new flag under the stars and stripes, put some signage on the door, added a few awnings, and even added a new patio for lunches on the five days a year when Missouri is comfortable enough to eat outside. Inside, we've had a lot of changes. The first year was more about getting the building safe and getting my tools to a point that they're functional. The second year was all about creature comforts, visual appearance, and refinement of the space. The biggest game-changing update to the space was covering the masonry walls with T111. We've got a mixture of cinder block in some places and brick in others, and it just sucks attaching anything to those walls. The amount of drilling, the kind of hardware that you need to use, it's just a real pain in the butt. But with T111 on the walls, I could pretty much move anything anywhere. Now, the way that we did this was putting a couple cleats on the wall first, anchoring that into the masonry, and then attaching the paneling to the walls with screws. So now I can easily move things around as the space evolves. It also looks a hell of a lot better and affords me space to hang all the fun stuff and the little touches that make this the Wood Whisperer shop. And having the T111 on the wall also allowed me to put my upper cabinets over the miter station where they belong, freeing up the space behind a table saw for a workbench and hand tool area. Now I actually did a video in 2022 about the layout and workflow of this space uh, pretty much at that one year point. So if you wanna go check that out, it's probably gonna be a lot more detail in there. But so many folks asked me to do something regarding the layout and workflow now, and there have been changes, so I figured we can go through the whole thing. The main bay of the shop is 31 feet wide by 34 feet deep and is essentially organized as three rows. A row of tools against the wall, a row of tools down the middle, and another row of tools against the other wall. Hand tools and workbench are at the very back, and at the front I have smaller mobile items that are easy to move out of the way when I need to. The adjoining single bay is 15 feet wide by 34 feet deep, and that's where I like to keep my clamps and wood, and it's also a flex space for things like Nicole's lasers and backside sandpaper production. So material comes in the small bay door and gets loaded up here. I've got, of course, all of my solid wood storage in the racks, and then over here is my plywood storage. So I essentially just grab whatever I'm working with that day and head into the main room. Now, if the project is plywood, I've got this open area intentionally cleared so that I could put some foam boards down and start the breakdown process so I can get the pieces small enough that I can move them to other tools like the table saw. Now, if it's solid lumber, usually we go to the assembly table and start the layout process for rough cutting. Behind the assembly table is the miter saw, and that's where I do my initial rough cuts. From there, I usually use my shop cart to collect the parts and move them around the shop. First, we head to the jointer. Next up, we hit the planer and sometimes the drum sander. From there, we can go back around to the table saw and bandsaw if needed. Of course, the rest of the work varies just depending on the project, and you're gonna jump around from tool to tool, so at that point, layout becomes a little bit less critical. But of course, every project ends with sanding and finishing, and most of that is done here at the assembly table or at the workbench. So as long as you make at least some effort to keep layout in mind, it's better than doing nothing. You don't just wanna randomly place your tools in your space. A little bit of effort goes a long way. And I'm gonna give you two pieces of what may seem like conflicting advice. One is don't be too rigid. 
always be willing to move things or scooch something over or try a different layout because you never know, you might be just one move away from what will seem like a perfect layout that'll improve your workflow. On the other side of things, don't not get work done because you don't have the perfect layout. Start working, start building. It's the building of furniture that will show you whether your layout is working correctly or not. So always just get in there and start making stuff. So now that you have kind of an idea of what my general workflow and layout is, let's head over to the entrance and do a walking tour so you can see everything. So here at the entrance, I've got my drill press and we'll get into some of the details there in a minute, but a lot of it just relates to drilling. This location previously was where I had my workbench and it turns out that's not a great place. When you have people who come in, especially my wife with an armful of stuff and she deposits it on the workbench, I found that I just never use the workbench here. So I'm so much happier with it out of this space. But we've of course got the drill press here and a whole bunch of storage and organization for all of my bits, everything related to drilling. I have most of my good bits in a little cabinet. This is a project you can get on the Wood Whisperer website, as well as a drill charging station where the drills hang and I have other you know, components and accessories that are there ready to go. Also plans available at the Wood Whisperer. Now, one thing I like about having this, you know, sort of metal cart, which is not really something that would be consistent with the wood cabinet storage that I have everywhere else, is different things happen here. This is where if I'm doing any kind of metal work, cutting metal dowels or anything like that, I've got all those tools and supplies specifically here away from my regular woodworking stuff. So you might notice here, we've got a whole bunch of little cookies up there with names. Those are some of our firehouse supporters. We've got a panel on both sides with all of these people's names here. So if you come by the shop, look for your name. So over here, I've got my two bandsaws. I spoil myself and allow myself to have two because I really like to have one dedicated to resaws and pretty much straight cuts. And then I have one that has a little smaller blade on it that's good for cutting curves. This is actually the C14 Harvey Ambassador. That is a new addition to the shop. Some of you haven't seen it yet. I love this saw so far, uh, so far so good. I've got nothing bad to say about it. Um, over here is the big boy, right? This is the 440p. I'm not good at memorizing uh, the model names, but this is an SCM saw. It is just beefy. A lot of horsepower, a lot of power and control. Now, real quick, between these band saws, I'm a little bit old school with this stuff. I like to be able to draw things. And I also like to be able to explain things with a whiteboard when I'm teaching. So this comes in handy. It's just a big old whiteboard, helps me with planning, helps me with, uh, you know, maybe doing some layout and joinery and gives my kids a place to draw. Of course, over here, it's all the electricity, the electrical panel. We have a, a phase converter for the planer, which you're gonna see in a little bit. It takes up a lot of space. And I also have the door to the kitchen here. So we have to have room for all that stuff. So really nothing, nothing substantial happens here. Maybe tripod storage. Now, as we round the corner, of course, we got a slop sink. I really missed having a sink in my shop. So this is one of my favorite things just to be able to wash my hands or you know wash anything out, glue brushes, things like that. Some safety stuff and like cleaning stuff here. I've got a nice rack for, honestly, I don't know why I have so many headphones and ear protection, but we've got a lot. So <laughs> some of it needs to be charged. That's all set up here. Uh, of course, I've got a TV, bit of a creature comfort, but a lot of times I do like to watch, you know, some kind of sporting event or just something in the background. And of course, behind a workbench, is my tool wall. This is where all my hand tools are set up for accessibility, very easy to get to, and it looks pretty good as a background for the show. And of course, over here is my pride and joy, my split top Rubo workbench with my tool cabinet. These are both projects that you can get in the Wood Whisperer Guild if you'd like to build it using our course. Now, a lot of people ask me what the heck happened with the workbench situation because I had a split top Rubo. I sold it, gave the money to charity. I think it was the Purple Heart Project. Uh, and then once we moved here, I wound up in a situation where I had this new hybrid workbench, which is a great workbench, but then there were two woodworkers. It was both me and Jason, and I really was trying to train him to be a woodworker, so he needed his own bench. So what we did was we went to the folks at Benchcrafted, and I actually, having built a number of workbenches in my time, had no desire to build another one. So I purchased this workbench, Jason got the hybrid workbench, and everybody was happy. So that's why this guy is here now. Now in front of the workbench is my table saw. This is not really dead center, but kind of the center of the shop. And I have a cluster of the saw stop table saw adjacent to my jointer. This is kind of an arrangement and layout that I've had for years. I don't know that it's the best way to do it, but it definitely works for me. I find it very comfortable because as these two kind of nest together, I always need to have a drop for my dust collection and a place for that to go. Plus I have my outfeed table. So I find that it just kind of nestles in there really nicely 
gives me a place for all the you know crap that I have to store there, including another vac, which is the overarm dust collection on the table saw. Now, speaking of that overarm collection, this is just something that I made from like material from Home Depot. And I have my vacuum hose going into the stock dust collection, right? This, uh, this guard actually works quite well. I think people overblow the concern about using these. They rip them off on day one and never put them back. I like using it. And the hose connects into a CT vac that sits in that little nook and does a great job of collecting from above. Of course, the regular dust collection handles the main connection at the four inch port on the table saw. Now the jointer, it's the one that I had in Denver. This is a Powermatic 12 inch helical head jointer. It's just a beast. It does a great job. Around the corner here is the outfeed table, which could double as an assembly table if you don't have separate space. Lots of storage here. This is also a build that we have available on the Wood Whisperer. Now let's head back this way because I want to show you the assembly table. Uh, this is something I haven't had for a while, just with moving shops around. And I really love having an assembly table, especially a nice big one, four by eight. The bigger, the better, as far as I'm concerned, for finishing, for project planning, layout, even drawing. It's just so nice to have. And if you can get storage in the base like I've got here, you'll be that much better off. This is also a build that we have available at the Wood Whisperer, if you're interested. So behind the assembly table is my Cyclone. This is a big Oneida Cyclone. Does a great job, it's a dust gorilla specifically. The only problem is that it is sharing a wall with my office and my computer is right on the other side of that. So not ideal, but that's the way it goes sometimes. You try to get these things located in the best possible location that's very near a door so you can very easily empty the dust in the bin but sometimes it just works out that it's not perfect. So as we round the corner here, we've got my miter station. This is a build that's in the guild and I absolutely love this thing. Storage galore. I added some upper cabinets up there, a couple of nice shelves with some fun stuff, tape measures, all that good stuff there. And of course my miter saw. Now the miter saw I have now is the Festal Capex. I get a lot of questions about that because I've been outspoken about changing miter saws in the past to try different things, see what it was like. The last saw I had was a simple DeWalt non-sliding miter saw. And when Jason started to work for me, I started to feel really bad watching him have to flip the average board over just to get the capacity we needed to make a simple cut. I was also aware of the fact that very few miter saws have good dust collection and the Capex is one that has fantastic dust collection. So it was really worth it for me to buy another one and have that as my main miter saw in the shop. Now, when I first built this thing, I kind of outfitted it with T-Tracks from Incra. They, they worked fine and I had some shop made stops that worked pretty well. But since then, Woodpeckers came out with their stealth stop system. And this thing is great. And this is absolutely not a plug. This is something that works really well. The stops are there when you need them, out of the way when you don't. And what I find most valuable about this is oftentimes I'll make a cut, I'll go use the part and then mess something up and I'll need that part again. It is so nice coming back here and going, oh, I haven't moved the stop, it's still there. So I can get the part cut to the exact length again. Now in these cabinets, I've got a lot of my small portable power tools, including my routers. And speaking of routers, here's my router table. Right now I'm working with the Woodpeckers fence and actually it's a whole Woodpeckers system. I got a, a Jessam switch on there. This works just fine. I do change my router table out quite often because there's new innovations that come up and I like to try them. Uh, mostly because, well, first of all, I'm kind of a dork with this stuff. I really enjoy trying new tools, but more importantly, I want to let you guys know how they perform, right? So when you ask me questions, I'm loaded with a good answer because I've actually used it myself. All right, so next up, we have a couple of powered sanding tools. This is my oscillating spindle sander made by Oliver. Absolutely love this thing. Big, huge table, very easy to work with. And as an aside, oscillating spindle sanders are kind of weird. Some companies rotate in one direction, other companies rotate in another direction. The only one, or at least one that I could find recently that does it correctly is Oliver. So highly recommend that. Uh, next to that is actually probably the newest thing to be added to the shop is my hammer belt sander. You may remember I had a big old grizzly disc sander. It worked just fine, but the problem with a disc sander is you really can only use half of the table. One half will send your piece up, the other half sends it down into the table. So it takes up a big footprint and you can't really use it all. This belt sander is way better in terms of giving me a nice long work surface for things like table legs or just sanding long parts. And it even has a little rounded thing, kind of redundant when you have a spindle sander, but this rounded end can be used for inside curves. So up from here, naturally, next to the sanding gear is my air filter. This guy just sits up there quietly running most of the time. Can't even hear it, which is great. And uh, it's up and out of the way. So behind this door is where we keep all the Cremona chickens. 
<laughs> Actually, this is just the smaller bay. We'll go into that uh, in a little bit. Uh, but as we round the corner, I got a big metal cabinet for all of my finishing stuff. Ideally, you want your finishes in a metal cabinet if possible, and even better if you can get like a true flammables cabinet, but uh, those are pretty expensive. Now back into the center row, we've got another cluster of tools. This is my Felder D951 planer. Now this Felder was a bit of a splurge, but it's also been a dream of mine to get this tool. I used one just like it for the first time uh, at the William Eng School when I was teaching there, and I have wanted one ever since. So it is an absolute dream to use, total overkill. Um, what I think the most important feature is that it has this nice carpet layer on the top, which is fantastic for cats. They absolutely love it. He spends most of his time there until it turns on. And then I have a Supermax 2550 drum sander. Now you may recall, I previously had a drum sander with a much larger foot. I had the double drum Supermax version. That was just more drum sander than I needed. And I also tripped over those little sprawling feet too many times. So I went with something that's uh, just a lot more manageable. Now up here by the front door, we have to have everything either light or portable and movable. So I've got my Festool MFT, which is great for breaking down sheet goods, squaring them off. I use the track saw right there. Of course, I have my track stored right here on the garage door, which by the way, if you don't do that and you're in a garage, it is kind of great free storage space. And you could buy these little clips. Um, I've got these that were, I don't know, FastCap I think makes those, but you could find a whole bunch of different versions of those. Of course, this is just you know, specific to us, I've got a, a big giant light that just broadcasts light into the shop for the sake of video. Here I have my Festool CT vac and essentially kind of a mobile sanding station. I will sand on the floor, I'll sand on the workbench, I'll sand on the assembly table. So I need this thing to be completely mobile. I also use this when I'm cutting my sheet goods on the floor. So that's easy to, to push around. And I've got a Rockler clamp rack, which is very handy. Now it is mobile, I don't really take it to the assembly table. I kind of just get things off of it and walk back. Uh, but if I do need to access this front of the shop or we get a big delivery in, I have to be able to move this stuff out of the way. And this is of course on casters and moves very easily. So now we're back at the entrance and I think we should go into the small bay, see what's going on over there. Now I had great plans for what we would do in this smaller bay. I wanted to put a CNC in here. I wanted to do all my finishing in here, my assembly. And you could see we put all the clamps on the wall, expected to be able to do live shows with this cool backdrop. None of that really happened. And I kind of realized that I want most of my woodworking stuff in the same room. Bringing projects in here to finish them or to glue them up in this kind of back and forth relationship between those two spaces doesn't really work out the way that I planned. So I do keep my clamps in here. So now they're out of the way, but I also use this space to store wood. And it kind of has become a bit of a catch-all space. Uh, Nicole does her lasering in here. If we have any kind of weekend sales that happen, they usually happen in this space. And it's just used for a whole bunch of storage for things that we just don't have room to put anywhere else. We also have a loft up there. We used to call that Jason's office. But I'm pretty sure this is a OSHA approved stairwell, but now it's just storage. The problem is you can't really stand up up there. So it's really uncomfortable, but it does come in handy to store things up there. Now for the wood storage, I use the same Granger racks that I had. These are pipe racks that I had in my shed in Denver. They work just fine. And I like the idea of the vertical storage as it allows me to kind of page through the pieces, see what I have. It's much easier than when you have boards laying on top of each other. And I also consider this fairly short term storage. This is the stuff I'm gonna go through fairly quickly. I got a lot of cherry, I got a lot of walnut. Those are the two woods I use the most. But I think this sort of organization works out really well in short term, no problems at all with that vertical storage. Right next to the lumber racks, I basically just have a, well, it's a little bit more than four feet wide section that gets used for sheet goods. I don't store a lot of sheet goods. So most of what I have here is just off cuts and leftovers from another project, but you need at least a four foot wide place to put those things. And those go right here for now. Now, because we do actually ship a lot of things from this location, we have to have storage space for that. Also tool uh, overflow, paint, lots of weird stuff. So these racks over here are useful for just storing whatever. Uh, of course, we have our sandpaper storage, which is still shipped from this location that happens here. And because I work alone so much, I often have the need for things that help me lift heavy stuff. I don't want to risk my back anymore, so I have to keep these you know, big machine and material removers and movers in this location. We just don't have anywhere else to put them. Now, I can't leave this room without drawing attention to something that may be slightly embarrassing. This is my lathe. 
it stays in here because I just don't use it that often. I'm a very utilitarian turner. If I need a turn part, it's here when I need it. I'm sorry, Ashley, please forgive me. But it's a great little lathe, does everything I need it to do. It's a Laguna Revo, no complaints about it whatsoever. So, but it lives in here, very lonely. The internet is filled with lots of free information about woodworking, but it can be tricky to sift through the ads, the influencers, and the DIYers flooding your feed. The Wood Whisperer Guild is the answer. Since 2008, we've been helping woodworkers learn the craft with the help of some of the best instructors in the industry. People who are not only at the top of their game, but also happen to make a living teaching people like you how to be a better craftsperson. All of our courses are presented in an easy to understand, step-by-step -step fashion, at a pace that doesn't skip the details. Courses include a PDF containing a cut list and sketches showing all the parts of the project. Plans are available in Imperial and Metric, and we even include a SketchUp file as a courtesy in case you want to modify the design. If templates are needed, you'll be able to make your own with our printable patterns, or you can purchase physical templates in our store. And unlike a lot of subscription-based sites that are out there, you own the courses you purchase, and we don't take them away from you. With 70 plus courses and 14 instructors, you're sure to find something you're interested in. Now, if you want to take your Guild experience to the next level, consider becoming a Guild Plus subscriber. Watch a classic Guild course each month. Save 5% on all Guild courses and pre-orders. Access to a bunch of vendor discounts. Attend a live demonstration every month. Access to interviews with notable woodworkers. Access our private communities, including the Guild Forum, the Guild Facebook group, and the Guild Discord channel. And finally, you'll have access to me, Mark Spagnolo, via a special contact form that goes right to my inbox. You could sign up monthly or save with a yearly subscription. Be the woodworker you've always wanted to be with the help of the Wood Whisperer Guild. So now we're on to the Q&A portion. This is where I asked you guys if you have any specific things you wanna see or questions, and I'll do my best to answer them or show you the thing you asked about. First up is from White Shadow 4689 Okay, let's see what you got, White Shadow. What's the story with the electrical outlets and circuits? I plan on building a shop within the next 18 months and wanna be sure to get it right from the get-go. For example, is your table saw on its own circuit? What breaker is used? Would you have used outlets in a ceiling if you don't already? All right, so here's the uh, breaker panel. This is actually a newly installed unit. There was a really old system in here when we moved in, and we did the best that we could to kind of find some of these old circuits that were no longer being used and to repurpose them for the tools that we have in here. So basically, in answer to your table saw question, pretty much any major power drawing tool that's gonna be on 220 is on its own circuit. That's always a good idea. You even want your dust collection to be on its own circuit because that's one thing that runs in conjunction with those other tools. If they're on the same circuit, you tend to have problems, right? So the size of the circuit is always gonna be dictated by the tool itself, the motor on that tool. So whether it's 20 amp or 30 amp, depends on a tool that you buy. If you're doing this stuff ahead of time, you can always wire for 30 amp and then have receptacles for your 20 amp tools. And then if you need to upgrade to 30 amp at some point, you could swap, you know, swap the whole system for 30 amp. Um, you don't necessarily wanna go the other way, doing everything 20 amp, because you won't be able to use that for a 30 amp tool. Now there is a type of circuit that you may be able to run. And again, I'm not an electrician, but I had pros install this. It's called a multi-wire branch circuit. So for a one person shop, it's kind of nice because then you have multiple tools that could be hooked up on that same circuit as long as they aren't run at the same time. Otherwise you get yourself into trouble. So it basically is a combination line. We've got one of the receptacles right down here where I have a 220 volt tool connected as well as 110 on the same circuit. And I could you know, put more of those down the line. So as I go along this particular, I think this is my north wall, I just have that line where multiple locations, we have a 220 and 110 connection. And you just wanna make sure that you are not running a bunch of things at the same time on that circuit. Now, one of the things we had to work out here was how to get power into the middle of the shop. You know, worst case scenario, you run an extension cord. Ideally, you do something a little bit better. So in our case, we were able to run new circuits for drops. In this building, we have access to the attic space above. So it was actually fairly easy to route everything up and over and have two clusters of drops for the tools that are in the center of the shop. So with these center tools, I got a 220 tool here, 220 over there, planer as three phase, that's a whole different thing. And then the drum sander, I believe is 110, but we need drops for all of these things. So we went up, over, 
got the drops down, and each one is its own independent circuit, bringing a female receptacle down to a level that we can reach it, and then we could plug in the tool there. So highly recommend you plan to either have those drops in place, which kind of offer you some flexibility if you wanna move it around a little bit, or if you're making this from scratch, not a bad idea to see if you can get into the plan some floor outlets. It's a little scary because you got to commit to a location with that, but floor outlets are also quite nice. So on a north wall, we did that multi-wire branch circuit. Over here, I had a different strategy because I actually had some wires run to this location that were not being used. So we split things up a little bit. The top is now a 20 amp 110 line. And that's all run exterior on that T111 all the way across the shop. And we just, you know, maybe every four feet, six feet, we have receptacle locations. And we also have a circuit that's run that is just exclusively a 220, 20 amp circuit that runs down here. And I have receptacles all along here, even though I'm not using them, they're there just in case I need to move things around. Now remember, the shop is always in a, a state of evolution. It's always changing. So the best thing you can do when it comes to power is have more than you need, have more receptacles than you need, and just be flexible. Make sure you have enough receptacles all over the shop so you can put anything anywhere. Next up is Matthew Wilson, 3884. I would like to know how you deal with finishing. Do you have a dedicated area for applying finish or does your shop shut down while finish is drying? I work on multiple projects at the same time and I don't have a dedicated area for finishing. I get very frustrated to have to wait for finish to dry before I can get back to wood prep and building. So with regard to finishing, for me, I don't usually have that problem. I mean, I'm not a production shop here, so I'm typically one in, one out. And once the project is in that finishing phase, I have so many other things I could be doing that I'm often in the office at the computer, so it's not a problem to let this project go through its drying phase without generating more dust. But if I do have something like that and I'm making a lot of dust, well, one thing I count on my dust collection. I have really good dust collection. I have good air cleaners, keeps that stuff from getting in the air in the first place. And then secondly, I tend to use a lot of hand wiped finishes, things like uh, hard wax oils, which aren't really as susceptible to, you know, a sort of contamination from airborne dust. You don't have to worry about it quite as much. So in my case, you know, it might be different than yours. Now that said, if I really had a problem and I needed something to dry while I worked on something that was just gonna kick up a whole lot of dust, I do have that other bay. So I think if I were a production shop and as soon as something goes into the finishing stage, I'm starting over with the next project, I would probably build some sort of standalone area that's isolated from the rest of the shop where I could at least put the projects while they're drying and have some kind of ventilation in there. I think that would help speed things up quite a bit. Jphanton75 says, interested in seeing your dust collection ducting. I know they're Norfab, but would love to see the ducting diameters, transitions to the tools as I'm designing my own at the moment. All right, so dust collection duct work. This is not something that I'm like a pro at. Uh, I do the best I can and I can give you some general advice. But if you have access to a design service, that's always the best way to go because they'll calculate the CFM requirements of every tool and then match it to the unit that you have and try to figure out the way to get the best air movement possible. But I'll tell you what I've got going on here to the best of my knowledge. So the port on this guy, I believe is 10 inches. We immediately downsize a little bit right there uh, with that fitting down to, I think it's eight, it might be seven, I don't know. But then it goes into this flexible duct range. Now that's really critical here because it, it allows me to raise the height so I can get my dust collection a little bit higher, less of a chance that I'm actually gonna smack a board into it. And we go up, at that point, things get kind of nuts. And my goal really is to stay as wide as possible for as long as possible. So you'll see we transition down from that, again, I don't know if it's seven or eight, down to two six inch lines. And then from there, we stay six inch as long as we can until some of the transitions shift over to five inch. Everything from that point is five inch down to four. And then I stay rigid for as long as possible. Most tools at some point are gonna have to have flexible hose, but you wanna reduce that as much as you can. The flexible hose definitely impacts the air movement. So we stay rigid as long as possible and reduce down to four if we can at the last minute. Now I could tell you what usually happens in reality. I've moved shops so many different times and I've got one set of NordFab ductwork, but I keep moving different things around, right? So I have to make use of what I've got. I don't really wanna buy more. So there are times where I reduce down to four a little bit sooner than I wanted to. And I'm not gonna spend the money to get another length of five just so that I could reduce a little bit later, right? But I will say diameters have a big impact. One example is on my big bandsaw. I initially changed my ports because they're metric. I changed them down to two four inch collection ports. And then this connection point that I had reduced down to five inch uh, early on. 
and then four inch way too early. So it was four early, and then it split into two other fours. Dust collection at that saw was just garbage. A couple months ago, I decided to change it. I shifted things around. I stayed as wide as possible, changed back to the original metric size, which is closer to five inch ports, and that works so much better. So diameter does play a, a very big role in this stuff. Now, if you wanna see some of the fittings here, I've got this connection where my jointer and my table saw are located, and I've got a rigid elbow there. You might be tempted to just transition right to that flex hose at that point, but the elbow really does help that airflow. You're also gonna to wanna to make extensive use of blast gates. Blast gates are great, because the whole point is, close off the areas you're not using and keep the routes that you are using open. I happen to have IVAC, it's an automated system, just makes life a whole lot easier. You certainly don't need to go that route because it is a little bit pricey, but it works great, I love it. So in this case, we have the two connections. I've reduced down to, I used the Y to reduce down to two four inch connections and each one of those goes to each of these tools. And surprisingly, it works pretty well. Could it use a little bit of improvement? Yes, but I just don't have the materials right now to do it. So again, I'm gonna reiterate that you wanna use design services. You wanna uh, get the best out of your system. You gotta go to someone who's willing to do a little bit of math. Garango27 says, would like to see any workflow amenities you have, air conditioning, floor mats, dehumidifiers, etc." So with regard to air conditioning, when we first moved in here, there was an air conditioner and heater in the back and then a double furnace unit here in the bays. Obviously we needed air conditioning. So we just replaced the furnace units. We replaced the compressors outside. So both of these bays are governed by two units. They are not separately controlled though. They kind of work together. I honestly, just given how well insulated this place is, probably could have gotten away with one, but it is what it is. That's what we have now. The offices in the back all have their own, just kind of like a residential style system, and it's all pretty old. So chances are at some point in the next couple of years, we'll be replacing that system. Uh, but altogether, that just keeps the whole place nice and cool. Now, we do live in Missouri. That means high humidity. And oftentimes, the humidity is the bigger problem uh, compared to temperature. So what we decided to do was add a fairly good size dehumidifier. This thing works really well. We've got it draining. That's the big thing with the dehumidifier. You can run it, but you gotta have a place for the water to go. We're really lucky here because the condensation drain from the air conditioners in the main, uh, the main bay, it actually runs down this way. So we were able to add a little T and just kind of connect this tube into that drain. And now this just lives here all year long and I only use it in the summer. Now, when it comes to floor pads, I'm a big fan. Over the years, I've had a couple different styles, the cheap uh, foam ones that you can get from the big box store, um, up to the point where I finally got sick of replacing those and got some really nice recycled, these are made from like recycled tires, rubber floor tiles. These are appropriate for a gym space, certainly appropriate for the shop, and they're great because they're, when you touch them, you would think, oh, these aren't gonna be very cushiony, right? But it doesn't take much give. They're firm enough that you could walk on them, you could roll some tools over them, not all, but some tools on them, but they just give you enough give for that forgiveness that makes your feet feel better at the end of the day, your back feels better at the end of the day. It also makes it so that you don't have to think so much about your footwear. I just wear running shoes in the shop. I don't wear anything special. I don't need much more support than that because most of the time I'm standing on these guys. So at the very least, if you can't do what I did and cover this much ground, just get a couple sets that you could put in front of your main tool areas and by your workbench and you can thank me later. Now, something you didn't specifically ask about, but definitely relates to this conversation, is the use of fans. Obviously in here, if I have a fan, it needs to be quiet. So I needed something that was large, that can move a lot of air. I have two fans on the ceiling and they do a pretty good job. The problem is the nature of what I do is very visual. And when those fans are on, a lot of times it creates a bit of a strobing effect in the video. So unfortunately, I can't have those fans on as much as I'd like to, but they definitely do help cool the space down. Now this one can be a little bit divisive. It's a creature comfort, but some people don't feel as appropriate to have a TV in the shop. Now I don't sit here and watch critical viewing television. I sometimes have it on for sports. If I need to look something up on YouTube, I've got that there as well. But I run an Apple TV on here and I have it all connected to a Sonos system so that I can listen to what's on the TV throughout the shop and I can play music using you know regular Sonos features throughout the shop. It is a nice creature comfort. I kind of love it. And this, this guy's my favorite. I love this guy, he's good. Scott asked, could you talk a little bit about shop layout and how it relates to dust collection? Which dictates which? Do you lay out the shop and then work the dust collection around that, vice versa, or a combo? 
So deciding on dust collection routing and tool layout is one of the most challenging things you can do in a space. In here, it took me a long time before I got to the point that I was confident enough to start running it. So we were here for months and I was actually running with a portable dust collector because I just was not sure what I wanted to do. Most importantly, I didn't know where I was gonna put the cyclone and that's a big part of it. I mean, this whole thing is really a balance. It's a back and forth between ideal tool location for workflow and then ideal location for, let's say the path of least resistance for your dust collection. And you just have to find the, the best case scenario for your situation. And you may not get it perfect on the first shot. So that's why one of my best pieces of advice is to do something that you can break down and move fairly easily. Now, not everyone is gonna want to justify or be able to afford NordFab or any of those quick connect systems. But if you can get that, that's gonna make your life a whole lot easier because even since I've run this system, I've made a couple of changes and without those quick connect systems would have been a whole lot harder. So really what you wanna think about is the least number of drops possible. Every time you drop or you branch off, you are taxing the system just that much more. So in my case, this is not perfect. It's just the best that I could get it. Every time I branch off, I'm trying to minimize the amount of turns, the sharpness of the turns, and minimize the number of tools that are connected to that leg of the system. So in the ideal world, let's say, if you were designing a shop from scratch, I think it's actually best to try to keep all of your dust collection tools or the tools that require dust collection kind of in the same area, right? So that you can hit them all in a line. So if you had a bunch of tools Hypothetical here, you got a bunch of tools along a long wall, you have your dust collector in that corner, you could have your main trunk run down that wall and have drops all along the way. Where you get into trouble is where you have tools in the middle of the room. And at some point you gotta run a branch out to the middle and drop to all those tools. The worst case scenario is what I ended up with here where now I have three rows. So I have dust collection here, dust collection here, and some dust collection over there but there was no way around it. I just did the best I could. And that's what it comes down to. Just do the best you can. And most of the time, these dust collectors are strong enough to kind of compensate for that. Uh, hopefully you got a really powerful one. So I mentioned it before, but I just want to reiterate, if you're in this process of designing your shop layout and your tool layout and dust collection layout, don't be afraid to go mobile. If you can get yourself a small portable unit, give yourself time. Time in the space will teach you where you want things to go and will prevent you from making decisions in a pinch that kind of, you know, paint you into a corner. Scott Getz asked, what do you keep in your shop for fire and medical safety? How about safety equipment for when using power tools? What about trash for anything that's flammable or caustic? All right, so for fire safety, I am in a firehouse, so I probably should have lots of fire extinguishers, and I do. I like to have at least one in each corner. We've got one in each room in the back of the office. Um, you know, just make sure they are up to date, get your inspections and whatever you're supposed to do for these things. As far as medical safety, first aid kits, right? Obviously you need a good quality first aid kit. We've got one hung on the wall in the bathroom. And I also have this little custom one that I made which contains some special things like tourniquets. Uh, it's got my tweezers in there. So whenever I have a splinter, I've got some really good sharp tweezers that work for that. So you definitely want uh, at least one good quality first aid kit. Now something that I should have in my shop, I've had it in other shops and I kind of forgot here, is an eye wash station. And I don't know why I spaced, and I'm glad I'm answering this question because it reminded me, I'm just gonna get a basic eye wash station, put it over here by the sink. Always good to have, no matter what, because you get something in your eye, if you got an opportunity to wash that crap out, you know, you're gonna be thankful for it. Justin Anderson, 8347 says, may not be entirely relevant to this shop, but I would love to know your average cooling costs in the summers over the years, as I'm working on getting my shop conditioned and I'm trying to get a rough number to work with in determining a baseline budget that I wanna have available before I commit to energy improvements and space conditioning. I know it won't be entirely applicable to my space, but it will give me a baseline from which I can extrapolate. Considering the variations in energy costs across the country, building integrity and size and equipment involved, I'm honestly not sure that this will be useful to you at all, but here's my energy usage over the last year. This particular graph is showing each month's total cost with the cost broken down by appliance type, operational load, heating, cooling, and the stuff that's always on. Lowest costs are in the spring when I'm not running the AC or the heat, and we're looking about $50 to $70 a month. During the winter, the cost goes up to about $90 a month, and in the summer with the AC on, we're hitting $160 a month. Jose Escato9069 says, would be nice to know what tools you're thinking of adding or replacing as you go along. So for tools that I'm thinking of replacing or getting new, I don't really have any replacements in mind right now. Pretty happy with most of what I have. 
As far as additions, I would like to get a CNC. Again, I had one back in Denver and didn't bring it with me. So the space over there in a single bay is gonna be perfect for just a nice little, fairly compact CNC setup over there. So that'll probably be in the next year. Von Welch asked, what would you do with 100 more square feet? So 100 square feet, that's quite a bit. I think my answer might be a little bit disappointing though. What I need is 100 square feet of storage space. I've got things in that small bay that are just in my way and I would like to get them out of the space. So things like my big material movers, the, the heavy lifter helpers, they just sit there most of the time. It would be really great if I had a space that I could just kind of get them out of the way so I could make more use of that space, especially after I do add more tools to it. I'm gonna need that room. So 100 square feet of storage space would be perfect. Really nice. Well, thanks to everybody who submitted a question and thank you guys for following along on this shop tour. I wanna to also mention for those of you who might want just a little bit more information, we're gonna have a video breaking out all of the shop organization details. And then another one showing some of the tech behind the Wood Whisperer, how we make these shows, how we make the guild videos, lots of cool stuff there too. All right, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. <laughs> Ass man. So thanks to everybody who submitted a question. I really appreciate, mm -hmm. try it again. We're gonna have a couple extra videos for you, including one on shop organization. Uh, my name's Mark. I like to build stuff and touch wood all day long. That's what I do. If it's got a hole, I'm sticking my dowel in it. Oh, I was wondering <laughs>